Good evening, friends. Welcome. Welcome to our Ash Wednesday worship service. Um, I greet the small cadre of you who have braved the elements to be here in the sanctuary tonight, and probably the larger number of you that are joining us online this evening. Wherever you are, we're glad you're worshiping with us as we begin the season of Lent on this first day of Lent, Ash Wednesday. On this Ash Wednesday evening, we pause to remember our mortality. We pause to remember our great need of a Savior. And in that spirit, let us, as we're able, rise and call ourselves to worship, if you will. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. God sent Christ into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God proves God's love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. You may be seated. Please pray with me together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first scripture reading tonight comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked, and I hid myself. This is the word of the Lord.
Our second scripture lesson for this evening is from the book of Joel, the second chapter, uh, selected verses. I invite you to listen once more for the word of God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will it again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord, the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the aged. Gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? And this is the word of the Lord. Indeed, thanks be to God. Join me for a word of prayer. Oh Lord our God, as we have approached your word this night, we come on this Ash Wednesday with hearts open to you, asking that you might once again speak to us, for you, we, your servants, are listening. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, we gather tonight on this Ash Wednesday evening uh, the day that marks the beginning of the season of Lent, a season that will span 40 days and six Sundays and then culminate on Easter Sunday. We generally understand that uh, this is an important season of preparation for our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus on Easter morning. We understand that this is a season of reflection and prayer a season to focus on the enormous sacrifices of our Lord Jesus on our behalf, for us and for our salvation. We understand that this is a season to renew our baptismal promises and our personal commitment to follow Jesus as faithful disciples. We understand all of this as we gather here on Ash Wednesday evening. But if we're honest... We're not quite as certain that we understand the significance and the importance of Ash Wednesday. I mean, it's a fair question, you know. Um, why is it necessary for us to endure this rather odd ritual of smudging our foreheads with dust on this first day of Lent in order to be properly prepared to celebrate Easter at the end of these 40 days? What exactly do we understand uh, to be happening on Ash Wednesday, and why is it important? What is this day, this day of ashes, really all about? Well, in her lovely book of essays that are entitled This Odd and Wondrous Calling, uh, Congregational Minister Lillian Daniel uh, tells a story of sitting in the back of the sanctuary uh, as a seminary intern, uh, reviewing her notes before uh, she uh, 
would be entering the pulpit for the very first time to preach her first sermon. She describes it this way. It was to be a mighty word from God that would correct all the hypocrisy, greed, and faithlessness of the local church that was nonetheless supporting my seminary education as they had supported that of so many. As I mustered my courage to sock it to them, I overheard one woman lean across her walker and whisper loudly to her pew mate, Ah, our new seminary intern. I see it's time for our annual scolding. (laughs) And I think perhaps that is how some of us view Ash Wednesday, the day of our annual scolding. The day each year when we are reminded in no uncertain terms that we are hopelessly sinful. That we have, as the Apostle Paul reminds us, fallen short and are unable to rid ourselves of this terminal affliction. But is that really what Ash Wednesday is all about? Rather than the day of our annual scolding, I have come to understand Ash Wednesday as the day of our annual reminder. Our annual reminder of the truth of the gospel. Presbyterian minister Tim Keller offers a succinct and thought-provoking description of this gospel. This good news, the news that we gather to hear once again tonight. Keller says this, he says the gospel is this, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted by our Lord than we ever dared dream. We love the last part of that equation, don't we? I mean, what's not to love about being completely loved and accepted by God? But sinful and flawed, well, we just as soon avoid that terse assessment of ourselves. In fact, that's a sort of uncomfortable truth-telling that might just drive us underground. That might just cause us to lie low, to hide out, and to wait for this awkward day of ashes to pass. And we are, are we not, pretty good at hiding We are. And we come by it rather naturally. In our first scripture lesson for tonight that Jenny read, uh, God comes looking for those first humans after they choose to accept less than the best that God has for them. They choose to disobey their God. And God searches for them. And the first humans did what was, in their minds, the only sensible thing to do. They hid. Have you ever tried to hide from God? Have you ever been so burdened, so ashamed of something that you've done, or perhaps worse yet, something that you've left undone, that the only sensible thing to do was to hide? The opening prayer that Jenny prayed uh, on our behalf uh, tonight is an ancient prayer of the church. It's uh, often referred to as a prayer for purity. It's a prayer that's been offered by countless believers through the centuries. It's really an old prayer. Do you remember the opening words of the prayer? Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. No secrets are hidden. I don't know how those words strike you, but I'm left with the impression that no matter who we are, no matter where we are, there's no place to hide from God. Like it or not, our lives are an open book. There are literally no secrets. And yet, we keep on hiding, don't we? Uh, I'm reminded tonight of the words of a contemporary prayer written by an Old Testament theologian, very wise theologian, Walter Brueggemann. 
This is his prayer. Almighty God, from whom no secrets are hidden, we are rich conundrums of secrets. We weave a pattern of lies in order to be well thought of. We engage in subterfuge about our truth. We carry old secrets too painful to utter, too shameful to acknowledge, too burdensome to bear, of failures we cannot undo, of alienations we regret but cannot fix, of grandiose exhibits we cannot curb. And you know them. You know them all. I remember a, a Friday several years ago, I was home on a day off cleaning the house, uh, and I got a phone call from a young woman uh, with whom I had originally become acquainted during her time as an undergraduate student at um, Whitworth University. She'd been a student in one of the classes that I taught at Whitworth, and she was an excellent student, straight A's. Uh, she was dedicated, dedicated Christian young woman. After she graduated, I was totally thrilled that she um, applied for and accepted a position as a youth minister at a church nearby uh, in my same presbytery. I was so pleased that this church was sharp enough to hire a smart, skilled youth worker and a person of exceptional Christian character. So this Friday phone call occurred after this young woman had worked for a number of years at this nearby church. Uh, and she had demonstrated herself to be every bit as exceptional as I understood her to be. She was so loved and so respected by all in this church that she served fellow staff members, the youth of the church, their parents. Uh, everybody thought she was so phenomenal. But during our Friday phone conversation, I discovered that my young friend was carrying a secret. Now, in the grand scheme of things, it really wasn't a big deal. But for some reason, it had been too difficult for her to keep this secret to herself any longer. So she confessed to me that she had cheated on a number of tests that I had administered all those years before. It had been so important for her to have a perfect academic record that it, it was important enough that in a moment of weakness, she cheated. Like I said, among all the things I could have imagined that she wanted to confess to me, um, it really didn't seem to me to be that huge of a deal. And yet, obviously, it was a big deal to her. And so I wondered to myself, how long had she rehearsed what she would say to me? When she picked up her phone, how long had it taken her to dial my number? I wondered what sort of response she expected to receive from me. And you know, when I think about it, I think that's why we continue to hide. We're so afraid that what we've done or what we've left undone will constitute that one offense, that proverbial last straw, the sin that God simply cannot and will not forgive. The anticipation, that uh, expectation of rejection is often more than we can bear. And so we hide. On Ash Wednesday, our God takes the initiative and comes looking for us. Our creator and redeemer calls out to us, just as he called out to the first human so long ago. And he asked that question, where are you? Where are you? Our willingness to answer God's question and to come out of hiding has everything to do with what we expect to happen next. If we expect to be berated or shamed, it's unlikely that we'll ever be able to respond to God calling to us. We'll simply find more sophisticated ways to hide. 
The prophet Joel, in our second scripture lesson for tonight, so eloquently describes God's natural inclination toward you and toward me. His natural inclination toward frail, sinful human beings like us. And God's natural inclination is not to berate and not to shame. Listen to these familiar and welcome words again. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Return to the Lord your God. This is the language of repentance, the language of turning. For this day of ashes is a day of repentance, a day of turning, a day to come out of hiding, a day to respond to our God's call and to turn back to the one who unfailingly is gracious and merciful and yearns for a relationship with you and with me. It's a day to acknowledge honestly how far we can stray from our God by what we've done and what we've left undone. From this one to whom we belong in life and in death. How far we've strayed from this one who in Christ loved us all the way to the cross. This one who died and rose again that we might have life. I once recently heard a, a brief poem that I think captures the significance of this day of ashes. It reads like this, a cross of ashes grits across my forehead under the calloused thumb of a fellow sinner. One day each year we exchange masks for marks and find mercy. See, friends, in just a few minutes, if you choose, you'll receive an ashen cross upon your forehead. You'll receive a mark on your brow, not as a symbol of our annual day of scolding, no, but as a symbol of an annual reminder of the truth of the gospel. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted by our Lord than we ever dared hope. That's the truth of the gospel. One of my favorite Roman Catholic theologians once wisely said that sin brings us to our knees. But mercy puts us on our feet again. This night as we return to the Lord our God once more with our hearts full of Lenten hope, Lenten expectation. May we find mercy without measure, for it is here in abundance for you and for me. May it be so that all honor and glory may be given to the one who has been revealed to us as maker, most blessed redeemer, and friend. Amen? Amen. Indeed, may it be so. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as
You may be seated. Please join me in the responsive prayer of confession. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your love. Blot out our misdeeds with your great compassion. Scrub out the stain of our wrongdoings and wash away the guilt of our sins. For we recognize our rebellion, it haunts us day and night. You are the one we have violated. You know exactly what we've done. You have all the facts before you. Whatever you decide to do is fair. We've been out of step with you our whole lives, conceived and born into a broken world. What you seek is your truth at the center of our souls. So enter us and reconceive us in the way you intend us to be. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Put a new and right spirit within us. Don't cast us away or take from us the breath of your life. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Blow the wind of your spirit into our souls. You do not desire empty rituals, O God. You don't want to hear us go through the motions, offering up repetitious prayers. What we offer sincerely is our broken spirits, O God. Take our wounded and repentant hearts and make them whole with your love. Amen. I invite you now into a time of silent reflection and prayer.
nations, merciful God, children of dust, as to dust we return. Sign us with ashes, merciful God, mark us and make us your own. Surely you alone redeem us, you fill our dust with holy breath, bursting from the grave in glory, you rise from the ashes of death. Sign us with ashes, merciful God, children of dust, as to dust we return. Sign us with ashes, merciful God, mark us and make us your own. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, uh, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there would be this 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when the persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of faith were reconciled by penitence uh, and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation uh, was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. You are invited, therefore, in the name of the church, in the name of tradition, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating upon God's holy word. To make a right beginning of repentance and as a, a mark of our mortal nature, let us humble ourselves before our Creator and Redeemer and receive the imposition of ashes. Um, those who would like to receive uh, ashes are invited to come forward much the way we do for communion by the center aisle and then return by the side aisle. Um, and so uh, let the people come. Jenny will be on the right side and I'll be on the left.
Please join me in prayer. Merciful God, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew us in the gift of baptism that we may provide for those who are poor, pray for those in need, fast from self-indulgence, and above all, that we may find our treasure in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. and pray. Teach us with you to mourn our sins and close by you to stay. As you with Satan did contend and did the victory win, oh, give us strength to persevere in you to conquer sin. And through these days of penitence, and through this passion tide, yes, evermore in life and death, O Lord, with us abide. Abide with us till when this life of suffering shall be past. An Easter of unending joy we may attain at last. And now, dear friends in Christ, go from this place resolved, resolved to live in holy fashion during the season of Lent. Go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain upon you this night and forevermore. And let God's people together say, Amen. Amen.